If you think you already know how the story of ice and fire ends, guess again, because the winds of winter are blowing. Tycho Nestoris had impressed him as cultured and courteous, but the Iron Bank of Bravos had a fearsome reputation when collecting debts. Each of the nine free cities had its bank, and some had more than one, fighting over every coin like dogs over a bone. But the Iron Bank was richer and more powerful than all the rest combined. When princes defaulted on their debts to lesser banks, ruined bankers sold their wives and children into slavery and opened their own veins. When princes failed to repay the Iron Bank, new princes sprang up from nowhere and took their thrones. As poor plump Tommen may be about to learn. No doubt the Lannisters had good reason for refusing to honor King Robert's debts, but it was folly all the same. If Stannis was not too stiff-necked to accept their terms, the Bravosi would give him all the gold and silver he required, coin enough to buy a dozen sellsword companies, to bribe a hundred lords, to keep his men paid, fed, clothed, and armed. Unless Stannis is lying dead beneath the walls of Winterfell, he may just have won the Iron Throne. He wondered if Melisandre had seen that in her fires. All right, so this pretty much tells you how the Iron Bank is thought about in Westeros. They are very powerful. And the fact that the ground Westeros is defying them by refusing not to pay back their debts is indicative of the fact that Stannis might be winning the war simply by the fact that they're not paying their debts to the Iron Bank. That's how influential and powerful they are because if you don't pay them back, they fund your enemies. Yeah, there's something really kind of kind of gangster and mobster like about the way they talk about them. Now, obviously the Iron Bank um, isn't necessarily the head of an organized crime network. I mean, who knows? But the the intimidation factor is what I'm talking about when they say, well, when princes failed to repay the Iron Bank, new princes appeared. Like <laughs> they can remove yeah. people from thrones of countries. So their level of power is that of a very powerful country. Their reach is far. And Tom is about to learn that to his peril. So you can either view what Cersei is doing by refusing to honor Robert's debts as very ballsy or just quite stupid. And I lean to more towards really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got some quotes to get into Cersei's. Uh, the way that she treats the Iron Bank is definitely not serious enough, to, to put it lightly. So that's basically the setup here. You know, that they they are... You know, they have a heavy shadow over Westeros. We're actually not just talking about the Iron Bank. We're, we're going to talk about the triumvirate of powers in Bravo. The three powers in Bravos, which are the Iron Bank, the Faceless Men, and the Sea Lord of Bravos. And we've already touched on the Faceless Men a little bit when the, uh, in the Arya episode, but we're going to talk about non-Arya Faceless Men things. So let's go ahead and start off with the origins kind of of all of this, really. It goes back to Bravos and the faceless men starting off in the minds of Valyria, of course. Um, but they were led to Bravos. You know, they were an escape, it was an escaped slave ship. It was headed to Sothorios. The slaves on board had a revolt. They took control of the ship. They sailed to Bravos and they disappeared for like a hundred years before they did this unmasking of Uthero. And then several centuries passed. And then there was the Doom, which of course we know they pulled off with Anar Targaryen. Hashtag the Doom is an inside job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nice plugging your own theory. <laughs> oh, of course. Never never fail to plug your own theory. So there's a quote here which kind of shows us that the Iron Bank really doesn't take dragons lightly. They consider them to be a, kind of a serious thing. So in this quote, it says, Would that we had one here. A dragon might warm things up a bit. And then, my lord, Jess, you will forgive me. I do not laugh. We Bravosi are descended from those who fled Valyria and the wrath of its dragon lords. We do not drape of dragons. No, I suppose not. My apologies, Lord Tycho. All right. So basically, John makes a joke about having a dragon in the north. And the guy is like, no, we don't joke with dragons. Because they remember <laughs> the oppression and the sheer like power of the dragon and how they took over everything and how brutal it was. Yeah. And even though it was the faceless men in the minds of Valyria, and we're talking about the Iron Bank here, this uh, Tycho is speaking for all Bravosi, and all Bravosi have a very sort of unified identity, and there's certainly clues that the Iron Bank and the Faceless Men are simpatico, if not all three, you know, including the Sea Lord. So, yeah, yeah. All, in all of Bravos, dragons are no joke. Um, however, it's not necessarily true that the Faceless Men and the Iron Bank 
are against dragons across the board. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. It just seems like they have a kind of apprehension towards dragons that goes all the way back to their origins in Valyria. Yeah, the one thing that may be different, of course, is the fact that Danny's not using her dragons to enslave people, but rather to free slaves and eventually confront the others. But like I said, we'll get to that. So our next big question is, how are the faceless men connected to what's happening in Westeros? All right, we talked about this a little bit in our Arya episode. They're obviously training Arya to do some task in Westeros. Uh, that's one thing. And then obviously they're using the faceless man that's where that was wearing Jack and Hagar's face in order to steal something from Old Town. Yeah, he came for, he became Jack and Hagar. Then he was the alchemist. Now mm -hmm. he's Pate the pig boy and he's hanging out in Old Town. Yeah, and so we got this quote here to talk about what it is that Jaken is after. We've alluded to it a few times that it might be this book about dragons, but let's go ahead and cue this quote. Tyrion had read much and more of dragons through the years. The greater part of those accounts were idle tales and could not be relied on, and the books that Illyrio had provided them were not the ones he might have wished for. What he really wanted was the complete text of the Fires of the Freehold, Galindro's History of Valyria. No complete copy was known to Westeros, however, even the citadels lacked twenty-seven scrolls. They must have a library in Old Volantis, surely. I might find a better copy there, if I can find a way inside the black walls to the city's heart. He was less hopeful concerning Septon Barth's dragons, worms, and wyverns, their unnatural history. Barth had been a blacksmith's son who rose to be King's Hand during the reign of Jaehaerys to Conciliator. His enemies always claimed he was more sorcerer than Septon. Baylor the Blessed had ordered all Barth's writings destroyed when he came to the Iron Throne ten years ago. Tyrion had read a fragment of unnatural history that had alluded to the Blessed Baylor. He doubted that any of Bar's work had found its way across the Narrow Sea. And of course, there was even less chance of his coming on the fragmentary anonymous, blood-soaked tome called Blood and Fire, and sometimes the Death of Dragons, the only surviving copy of which was supposedly hidden, locked away in a vault beneath the citadel so, so whatever he's looking for seems to be related to dragons and their nature and potentially how to kill them kill them or perhaps control them because of They'll course this book has a lot of information about dragons and even though it's called the death of dragons there's useful information that one would need to control dragons so their agenda certainly could be to kill all the dragons but if it's not if it's something other than that then it's then they might be actually wanting Danny to control them better. So I, I think that's an outside chance of that even happening. But the other interesting thing about this quote is the fact that they note all these books are in Volantis. Like Tyrion's thinking about, oh, if I could just get to the library of Volantis, they've got some really good dragon books there. Well, if the faceless men can get to Old Town and steal books from the library in the locked, you know, vault or whatever, then they can probably check out books, if you will, check out from the Volantis library as well. Yeah. They might have already been to Volantis, but the book or knowledge that they wanted wasn't there. And so they got to go to, cit to, the cit to the Citadel. The Citadel. <laughs> so they got to go to the Citadel. <laughs> yeah, that just kind of shows you like how important blood and fire is. And it also shows you that they might be on a quest to like track down the most elusive books about dragons that they can find. And that might be what this book is. So that is very interesting as far as what is their agenda, which we'll talk about near the end. So our next question, first we just asked how the Faceless Men connected to Westeros, and now we're going to ask, how is the Iron Bank connected to Westeros? And we said at the, at the outset, we mentioned most of this, so there's basically three ways. There's the King's Landing loans, which were Robert's debts and have now turned to Cersei's debts. There's a new alliance that they're forging with Stannis, and then there's some loans that Tycho made to the Night's Watch. All right, so this next quote is one example of how Cersei thinks about the Iron Bank. You can see here that Pycelle is kind of warning her of the trouble that the Iron Bank could potentially cause. And she just kind of says here, the Iron Bank will have its due when I say it will. She doesn't really understand the potential threat and the potential danger that she's putting herself in and, you know, her entire family in by, you know, brushing them off like this and kind of dismissing them the way she is. 
Yeah, she's like the bravosi would squeak and squawk at her, but what of it? And that's like, what of it? Well, they can they can kill you, Cersei. They can take you off the throne. And Pycel, yeah, a quavering voice. This will cause more trouble than you know. The Iron Bank. And she cuts him off. Oh, they remain on Bravos, far across the sea. You know, a Lannister pays his debts. And then he fires back the Bravosi have a saying too. The Iron Bank will have its due, they say. So it's like kind of yeah. menacing there. Again, it's that whole gangster vibe. Like she's Pycelle's trying to tell her, like, dude, you don't just not pay the Iron Bank. So then later, same book, Feast for Crows. Bravos has now escalated to sending envoys instead of notes or whatever. And Cersei had put him off for a whole two weeks, letting Lord Giles cough at him or whatever. Lord Giles, the coughing uh, treasurer. And so finally, Cersei has to talk to him. The guy's name is Nomo Demitis. Noho Demitis. And so Cersei thinks to herself, an irritating name, an irritating name for an irritating man. His voice was irritating too. And then it says, Cersei shifted in her seat as he went on, wondering how long she must endure his hectoring. So this is an example of George like writing Cersei's inner monologue so that we know like her very warped perspective, you know, oh, she's suffering. She's got to, she's got to listen for five minutes to this person who's loaned her like just back bush, uh, bushels of gold. I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, well, you know, Cersei's never really had to experience anything like the Iron Bank holding anything over her head because, you know, she was the daughter mm -hmm. of Tywin, the richest, most powerful man in the, in the kingdom. And then she was the queen so she's been at such a high level of power for so long, her entire life, basically, that it's like maybe she really doesn't think that the Iron Bank could take her down. And I mean, she's kind of laser focused on like Tyrells and, you know, the witch's prophecy that she's not really seeing the looming threat that's right there ready to take her down at any moment. Yeah, you're right that Cersei's privilege probably contributes to her sort of blindness on this issue. And like during this exchange, She's putting him on and, you know, he's saying, oh, I talked to Giles six times. And she's like, oh, seventh time, maybe you'll be lucky. And he's getting tested and he's like, oh, it pleases your grace to make a jest, I see. And she gets, she tries to get gangster. And she's like, when I make a jest, I smile. Do you see me smiling? Do you hear laughter? I assure you, when I make a jest, men laugh. And he's like, King Robert. And she's like, is dead. The Iron Bank will have its gold when this rebellion has been put down. And then it says, he had the insolence to scowl at her. <laughs> She's like, so just, the uh, insolent. Your grace, uh, this audience is at an end. Cersei had suffered quite enough for one day. Poor Cersei. She was just afflicted with this short conversation. Anyways. <laughs> Freaking peasants trying to talk to her about paying back her debts and stuff. What? So Cersei refusing to pay back Robert's loans and to order the, the crown's previous loans is also affecting merchants in King's Landing's ability to get loans. All right, so a group of merchants appeared before her to beg the throne to intercede with them for um, loans for the Iron Bank. Uh, the Bravosi were demanding the repayment of their outstanding debts, it seemed, and refusing uh, any new loans. Uh, so Cersei decides we need our own bank. We need our new bank. We'll have the Golden Bank of Lannisport. Yeah, it's and she totally says, perhaps, unrealistic. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like it's like it's like oh, we don't need their bank. We'll make our own new bank, right? So yeah, you need yeah. money for that and you need, you know, to build up a certain sense of trust to just, you can't just start a bank that's not the way it works and she clearly doesn't understand. You know, like the Iron Bank is going to let Cersei just start a new bank in Lannisport. Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> I don't think so. Not until you pay your debts. And so like, I, like, like you were saying, Quinn, this is now affecting, it's another escalation of the banks sort of demanding their gold back. They're now refusing loans to everyone in King's Landing. So this situation really should have Cersei's attention and it still doesn't. And so yeah. that's the point at which we see uh, Tycho Nestoris turn up in the north with an offer for Stannis. The banker pressed his fingers together. It would not be proper for me to discuss Lord Stannis's indebtedness or lack of same. As to King Robert, it was indeed our pleasure to assist his grace in his need. For so long as Robert lived, all was well. Now, however, the Iron Throne has ceased all repayment. Could the Lannisters truly be so foolish? You cannot mean to hold Stannis responsible for his brother's debts. The debts belong to the Iron Throne, Tycho declared, and whosoever sits on that chair must pay them. Since young King Tommen and his counselors have become so obdurate, we mean to broach the subject with King Stannis. Should he prove himself more worthy of our trust, it would of course be our great pleasure to lend him whatever help he needs. So there you go. Um... 
You can see Tycho with his fingers pressed together saying, oh yes, well, perhaps if Lord Stannis would be amendable, I might be able to help him out. And in fact, that is what happens. Um, the Theon Winds of Winter chapter opens with Stannis actually signing that deal in blood. So this deal is going forward. And that means that like John was thinking in the opening quote, Stannis may have just won the war if he doesn't die at Winterfell. This is a direct example of the Iron Bank doing what people always said they would do, which is fund the enemies of those who refuse to pay them back. That's exactly what they're doing with Stannis. Yeah, and it's an interesting writing device to sort of give Stannis a boost when he's kind of like hard pressed, huh? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So do you think Stannis is gonna live long enough to uh, count these golden dragons? I don't think Stannis is going to be able to repay back the load. I don't see him ever on the Iron Throne or as ruler of Westeros. Probably not. I do think he'll make it out of the Battle of Ice. Oh, yeah. But I don't know that he'll live much longer than that. Um, yeah, and probably never as king. So we'll see. We're going to talk about who the Iron Bank, who else they might bank uh, back besides Cersei in a minute. But let's talk about this Night's Watch loan real quick. Um, it's pretty simple, really. Uh, John's thinking about the deal, and it says, Provosi coin would allow the Night's Watch to buy food from the South when their own stores ran short, food enough to see them through the winter, however long it might prove to be. A long, hard winter will leave the Watch so deep in debt that we'll never climb out, John reminded himself. But when the choice is debt or death, best borrow. So that said, it took a couple hours, and they drank a bunch, and they were both not happy by the end. But basically, John hammered out a deal. Which the Night Night's Watch sorely needed because they were lacking for resources. And winter is coming, and there's less of them than there's ever been before. Pretty much the best move that John could have made. Yeah, pretty much no choice. In fact, again, it was uh, a stroke of luck for John when he's hard pressed there. So it's interesting to see the Iron Bank. And when we're talking about like getting ready for the winds of winter, this is a plot thread that is just developing. It's going to be even more important in the next book. So <laughs> I can see, I can see John, like, you know, he's, he's, un, he's dead still, you know, he's laying on the ground. He's about to be resurrected. And Tycho's sitting there like, you owe me money, bro. You better not die. Wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay me back. <laughs> exactly. So our next big question is how is the Sea Lord of Bravos connected to what is happening in Westeros? Yeah, there's, there's not a ton here, not as much as the Iron Bank and the Faceless Men, but there is a couple things. So um, the whole wedding pact between Viserys and Ariane Martell from like way back when, the Sea Lord was a witness to that. We'll read that paragraph in a second. Um, the Sea Lord then sheltered Danny and Viserys for a time. And uh, he seizes some slave ships that uh, one of the ones that came from Hardhome in A Dance with Dragons. And the Sea Lord also commands a powerful war fleet, which is a little bit of a Chekhov's gun and that it's a huge fighting force that we haven't seen come out to play yet. So let's start with that bit about Viserys and Ariane. All right, so there was basically an agreement to wed Viserys to Ariane. Here's the quote right here. It is a secret pact, Daddy said, made in Bravos when I was just a little girl. So Sir Willem Derry signed for us, the man who spirited my brother and myself away from Dragonstone before the usurper's men could take us. Prince Oberyn Martell signed it for Dorn with the Sea Lord of Bravos as witness. The alliance is to be sealed by a marriage. It says, in return for Dorne's help, overthrowing the usurper, my brother Viserys, is to take Prince Doran's daughter, Ariane, for his queen. Right, and that got obviously messed up when Viserys was killed by Caldrogo. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> but it does mean that the Sea Lord was sponsoring a Targaryen restoration. And that's the same message that we take from, you know, sheltering Danny and Viserys there in Bravos. So again, this is an interesting thing. Like the Faceless Men, if they're completely anti-dragon, they could have snuffed out Viserys and Danny's life at any point. They mm -hmm. definitely knew they were there uh, and didn't. And they let the Sea Lord, again, plot with Illyrio to have this Targaryen restoration between Viserys and Ariane, and then later Drogo and Danny, and possibly Fagon. So this is going to be a running thing as far as how Bravos feels about the Targaryens. So they're clearly uh, considering the nuance of the situation and it's not so black and white for them as everything Valyrian is bad. If they could potentially utilize Targaryens for their own good, then they will. Yeah, especially if one of them manages to sit on the throne because what they want is their money back. They love gold. That's why I'm wearing all my gold. It's all about the money. So, it's all about the money, right? So if Fagon takes... Um, 
the the throne in King's Landing, like we think that he will, um, shout out to our next Fagon episode, he would probably supplant Cersei there. And if Stannis is stuck in the north or Stannis dies, you definitely better believe the Bravosi will turn up at Fagon's doorstep and be like, hey, it's time nice to Iron Throne you got there. <laughs> 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 yeah, because the debt is to the to the crown, to the throne, not necessarily right. any one individual. That's right. And you can see that in that last quote we read a couple back, you know, whoever sits the, the throne is who owns the debt. So mm -hmm. that's the price of rule there. So and then, like we said, there is a big war fleet here. And this is a really cool quote because it tells us a lot about Bravos as a whole. So check this out. Despite its humble origins, Bravos had not only become the wealthiest of the free cities, but also one of the most impregnable. Volantis may have its black walls, but Bravos has a wall of ships, such as no other city in the world possesses. Lomas Longstrider marveled at the titan of Bravos, the great fortress of stone and bronze in the shape of a warrior that bestrides the main entrances into the lagoon. But the true wonder is the arsenal. There, one of the purple-hulled war galleys of Bravos can be built in a day. All the vessels are constructed following the same design so that all the many parts can be prepared in advance and skilled shipbuilders work upon different sections of the vessel simultaneously to hasten the labor. So assembly line, ships, they can make one in a day. And the, you know, this is basically the main defense of their city. So they already have a big fleet and the Sea Lord, as the name indicates, is in charge of that. Yeah, so that could be potentially useful if somebody needed a bunch of ships. To make Somebody. a bunch of ships real quick, or just uh, totally. oh. a bunch of ships that were already built. <laughs> yeah, and he's moving the army back and forth. In, you know, I was going to say, if they're interested in the Targaryen restoration, I Danny could always use ships. But yep, there's going to be refugees in Westeros looking to be rescued from places, and you know, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of things at play here. And Fagon, you know, again, if they make a deal with Fagon, then maybe he can get access to that fleet. So. That would turn the tide against Danny if she's sailing in with her Ironborn fleet. So anything is anything is possible here. All right. So the next point is uh, that slave ship that that's called the Goodheart, and it came from Hardhome. There was two of them, and the Sea Lord seized one of them. So one of the things this quote shows us is that the faceless men are probably aware intimately of what's going on beyond the wall because we just got this huge ship in from hard home right it's full that of like terrified people <laughs> know what's going on yeah i mean they've just been had the bejesus scared out of them at hard home running from whites and others and all kinds of things they've seen all kinds of things so yeah the, the faceless men and and who are this i guess would be the sea lord and pretty much everyone in bravos is going to be hearing tons of stories about this now yeah, definitely. Because uh, we don't even really know what horrible things they saw at Hardhome. We just got, you know, John's little letter that he received that just had like kind of hints of what went down. So I imagine that perhaps maybe more stories will be floating around uh, Bravos and all over Essos potentially as to what's going on in the north of Westeros. Yeah, that Cotter Pike letter to John is one of the creepiest things in A Song of Ice and Fire. It's like situation very bad, you know, eating the dead, uh, dead things in the water, dead things in the woods. It's like, oh man, this is kind of reminds me of uh, what came out of Summer Hall as it was burning down, you know, kind of the fragmented letter. Oh, yeah. Fall. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's like we don't get much information, but what we get is very bad. Mm hmm. So exactly. I mean, in true George Martin fashion, as we find out the truth, it'll only get worse. So yeah, maybe we'll hear about some of what's going on um, in Hard Home when Arya's, you know, still in Bravos here. So, so and another good thing about this quote is that it shows you how the faceless men prize information. They're always asking Arya to learn three things. And so they've trained Arya to be good, as assumed uh, good at collecting information. And I'm sure they train everybody the same way. And probably the... The Faceless Men and the Iron Bank and the Sea Lord probably exchanged information a lot. And so when, like we were saying last time in the Arya episode, when in doubt, assume that the Faceless Men know about stuff. And here we see Arya giving them a ton of good information. And then of course, we can also see that the Sea Lord takes an active hand in fighting slavery. As we mentioned earlier, the Bravosi are against slavery. And so that may influence their actions going forward too. 
All right. So one big question is what magical forces are the powers of Bravos aware of? So like I just said, that quote that we just read does mention the ship from Hardholm. So those people obviously will have stories about the others. And we mentioned before in our Ari episode that the faceless men seem to be like connoisseurs of different magical things. So they're likely aware about, you know, any number of magical things that we we've seen in our story or heard about in our story. And obviously everybody knows about the dragons. The dragons have been making pretty significant impression all over the East. So I'm pretty sure everybody's aware of that and they don't take it lightly as we mentioned earlier. Yeah, and a great point you made when we were chatting about this episode uh, in advance was that because they have so many different artifacts, they probably are aware of the general like idea that magic is getting stronger because of the dragons or whatever. Because you can see that in Karth and the Pyromancers in King's Landing, all the spells are like they're ripping now. You know, they're working better. So Faceless Men have probably picked up on that too. And then the Faceless Men are obviously aware of Arya's skin changing abilities. Um... It'd be pretty strange if they weren't, and it's likely that they intend to utilize her specific powers to accomplish some mission in Westeros. Like we've said yeah. multiple times, they're clearly aware of the others as well. At so least there you go. Are, and, you know, most people because of the slave ship. Yeah, so essentially, like we said, when in doubt, assume that they know. And so this is interesting because, like, the Iron Bank... And the Faceless Men, it seems like a very political plot, like it's a bank, right? But there's a little bit of magic involved. And really, you know, when you talk about bankers, Wall Street, and how the stock market reacts to things, they only care about results. They care about money. And anything that affects the bottom line, is they care about. So if the White Walkers are going to invade, you know, they got to under they got to know how that affects everything. And mm -hmm. they probably don't want the world to end because they won't get any of their loans repaid if the world ends. So... I tend to think that there will be a sneaky play here where the powers that be at Bravos actually do take a hand in the end game scenario. So something to keep your eye on. Definitely. Well, like you said, if it affects their bottom line, you know, when it is when the Iron Bank is concerned, especially, they're not gonna they're not gonna want that to happen. So obviously the White Walkers destroying Westeros will you know, they're never going to get the money back if, you know, the White Walkers, the White Walkers take everything over. So, of course, they'd rather have someone like maybe Danny in power, someone that can, you know, repay the debt because all they want is money. It's all that matters. They're not going to Stannis because they feel because they're, they want to support his right to the throne. They're going to Stannis because maybe we can get our money back this way. That's right. And I just I mean, it's one of the most absurdly delightful moments in A Dance with Dragons when Asha sees Tycho and Nestoris come out of the snow with the weird hat and she's like seeing his shape emerge in the snowstorm. And it's like, who is it? It's a Bravosi banker. Okay, that's not what I expected. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and of course he shows up with Theon and the Iron Man, not with Theon, but with the Iron Man uh, from uh, Deepwood Mott in yeah. tow. So yeah, very cool, very cool. Tycho and Nestoris, this is your big moment, buddy this this uh this video right here yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing i will say about this is that i'm most interested in in their uh attitude towards denarius um they're anti-slave and they're not like i said they're collecting you know the faceless men are collecting dragon information so i tend to think that they might be down with danny and that could be a huge huge factor in the end game so leave comments below with how you think your favorite uh, Iron Bank Faceless Men conspiracy or how you think they're going to affect things going forward. Yeah, just one more thing on their attitude towards Danny. Danny is, in a lot of ways, kind of righting the wrongs of old Valyria. Uh, like she is, you know, she's kind of righting the wrongs of her ancestors, you know, uprooting the slave trade. Um, she's not, she's trying to help people rather than oppress and enslave people and gain power for herself. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I've, I've done a couple of podcasts about that very thing. So yeah, I'm right on the same page there. And I think, uh, I think that, you know, I like the idea that the faceless men helped cause the doom, you know, which obviously they, they pretty much is certain that they did. Uh, but then, you know, Danny, again, is the exact opposite of the Valerians. And so they might look at her totally differently. So there you have it. There is our episode on banking and assassination. <laughs> 
Banking and murder. Banking and murder. We should change the title to banking and murder, perhaps. Maybe. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. You heard it here first. That's, I mean, that's always been the title. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Remember to subscribe and share the videos. Uh, thanks for coming on this ride with us. And we'll see you with another most anticipated plot line of Winds of Winter tomorrow. Thank you guys for watching. Over the next 23 days, starting right now, we'll be releasing videos alternating between both of our channels, covering all of the awesome stuff that's coming in A Song of Ice and Fire, book number six, from Jon Snow's The Resurrection to Euron Greyjoy's Apotheosis. So make sure you subscribe to both of our channels so you don't miss anything. And those links will be in the description, of course.